I'm recording an album here tonight. Why I'm recording it, I have no idea. <laughs> it's going to be a giveaway album, that's what it's going to be. As soon as I'm finished with it, my friends will be there waiting for me, I'll give me an album. <laughs> I'll say to them, why don't you buy an album? Me? Buy your album? <laughs> give me an album. <laughs> that's what's going to go out with this album. Because that's one of my problems, you know, I don't get no respect. No respect at all. Every time I get in an elevator, the operator says the same thing to me. Basement? <laughs> I mean, I no respect. Remember when I was a kid, we played hide and seek. They wouldn't even look for me. And the other day, I was standing in front of a big apartment house. The doorman asked me to get him a cab. <laughs> Same thing with my friends, no respect. My friends tell me when I call them on a the phone, I should use a certain signal. I should let it ring twice, hang up, and don't call back. <laughs> Forget my friends. My friends don't go for a dime. I got the kind of friends like, they'll pay for the cab to the airport, then I pay for the flight to the coast. <laughs> they come to see me here sometime, my friends. You know. and they give me a lift home but they never take me home, they always drop me somewhere. <laughs> they always have to make a turn. You know. I make my turn, you're home, you're home. You walk up 12 blocks, you walk through the park, and you're home, you're home, you're home, you're home. Yeah. No matter what condition I'm in, my friends don't worry about me. No matter like they figure, they get him out of the car, push him out, go ahead, he's all right, he's all right, he's big, they'll think he's a cop, go ahead, get him out, he's all right, go ahead, push him out. <laughs> and they pushed me out of the car once, a few months ago. They pushed me out on 49th Street. I was, who knows, drinking, who knows where I was at. You know, and it wasn't 49th Street, they were off Broadway somewhere. So I heard music coming through the old nightclub. I remember the song, it was The Breeze and I. And I saw a sign on top of the nightclub. It said, Inside, 20 exciting girls. I told myself, that's not too bad, you know? In my life, I'm lucky if I meet one exciting girl a month. I go in here, I'm set for a year and a half, you know? <laughs> I found out it's very possible to meet one of these exciting girls. As I walked in, a man saw me. I heard him yell out, Estrelita! <laughs> a girl came over to me. She was wearing a very shiny dress, I remember. You know. She looked at me. She said, you're cute. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little cute, you know. I don't know. <laughs> She said, no, you're cute. The butter, the champagne. <laughs> oh, this is Trevita. She was a strange girl. You know. She only drank champagne and came in six-quart bottles. She smoked cigarettes that came in packages of 200. I found out she worked in this club nine years. Just when I walked in, she decided to buy souvenirs. <laughs> cost me $15 for a stuffed animal she couldn't even pronounce. She said, I want the one with the long neck. How you say a carafe? <laughs> Later on that night, I was going to take us to eat to the breakfast. You know, I was afraid. She was to order a chain of luncheonettes. What do I know? You know? <laughs> no respect at all. But the other day I called up, I wanted to get the right time. The record hung up on me. <laughs> I don't know, you get all kinds of characters, you know. Like I was standing in front of the club before the show. I figure I've been on television, I want to see if people recognize me. There was one guy that he kept looking at me and looking at me. He said, where do I know you from? I said, well, you ever watch all the big variety shows on television? He said, yeah, you too? <laughs> well, I mean, there's characters. Come over here by cab tonight. Now, I tell you, I think they should pass a law that cab drivers should not be allowed to talk to you. I mean, I had a guy tonight, for 10 minutes, I listened to batting averages. He told me the best movie he ever saw was King Kong. <laughs> Eddie Fisher is better off. <laughs> everything, he told me everything. His wife ain't no beauty, but at least he knows where she is. Everything, he told me everything. I mean, this cab driver, he kept yelling and yelling. I'll tell you, this cab driver, he hated things I never heard hated before. 
I mean, how can a bus be illegitimate? <laughs> I had trouble with a woman cab driver. She couldn't take a joke, you know. I got in the cab, she said, where to? I said, your place. And she took me to a garage. I'll tell you, people are never happy. Never. I mean, some people go to India. They want to find the mystery of life. I'm still trying to figure out how to start my car. Because I got a car, forget about it. And every Sunday, I take my family out for a push. <laughs> I'll tell you, with my car, when I'm on a highway, just once, I'd like to see someone pass me without pointing to one of my tires. <laughs> all these new highways, they give me trouble too. You know. No matter what lane I'm in, it always ends in 500 feet. <laughs> I'll tell you, with cars, you don't know who to believe. I went to a place last week, wanted to rent a car. The guy there told me they got something new. He says you can pick up a car in one city, use it all you want, then drop it off in another city. I mean, this isn't new. Years ago, when I was a kid, I did the same thing. <laughs> Anything with cars, I'm unlucky. I always get lost. And the way people give you directions, you can't help but get lost. They always tell me the same thing. Go straight ahead, you can't miss it. Just keep going straight ahead. As soon as I pull away, I come to a fork in the road. <laughs> I ask people directions sometimes, they start laughing at me. I tell them, how do I get to Main Street? I really don't know, I couldn't help you. What's so funny? I don't understand, you know? I mean, I had a guy last week, he gave me uh, religious directions. Have you ever got these guys? He says, you go down here to St. Anne's Church, you make your right. You keep going past St. Mary's, past St. Catherine's. You pass Holy Trinity. You come to Our Lady of Mercy. I mean, after he gave me those directions, I didn't even thank the guy. I looked at him and I said, I bless you. you know, these guys, you know, these guys who fix cars are always trying to outsmart me. I took my car one place, a guy gave me an estimate for $100. I got the bill, it was $200. I said to him, how about the estimate for $100? He says, you're right, I forgot, that makes it $300. Any kind of traveling, I'm unlucky, I'll tell you. I hate to fly, you know. I'm really scared when I fly. Everyone gets nervous, you know. Last time I flew, I was really nervous. The pilot made his first announcement. He said, your tips are my salary. <laughs> the second announcement was a beauty, too. He asked if LaGuardia was open late on Thursday night. <laughs> And I'll tell you, I got no confidence in the pilot. When he makes a left turn, he puts his hand out. Should have known something was wrong when I got in the plane. The no smoking sign was smoking. I don't know, even figure life out. Actually, I spent most of the uh, summer working in the Catskill Mountains. I make a lot of money in the Catskill Mountains, a lot of money. I pick up the dead animals on the throughway. That's a lot of fortune. The big thing in the Catskills is romance. That's very heavy up there, romance. Every night at the bars up there, you see fellas meeting girls. You know, how do you do? Harry's the name. My friends call me Hesh the Tumbler. <laughs> <laughs> Just up for the weekend, I don't know where to go. The Catskills or Paris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another big thing in the Catskills is Fiddler on a Roof. That's very heavy up there. Fiddler on a Roof is very big. A, uh, See, every act up there, you want to be a big hit, you just do anything from Fiddler. <laughs> every act's a big hit. You see Italian singers up there, if I was a rich man, hey, boo, 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 boo. It's a wonderful, marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. And uh, from the lounges, I see colored drummers up there, you know, some rats on set, some rats on set. You know, Sal, tell the waiter, bring the food when he's on. I will go to the men's room when he's on. I come on, people always gotta go places, do things. I always feel like I'm background for bodily functions. But I worked them all. I worked every dungeon there is. You I spent my youth waiting for buses in Jersey and Staten Island. 
And you haven't lived until you've been in a men's room at a Staten Island ferry. What a men's room. It's the kind of men's room like if you have to go real bad, you hope it's busy. Kid and I were places like the Silhouette Cafe, the Club Jinx, Aldo's, formerly Vito's, formerly Nunzio's. It was a tough place, Nunzio's. I worked there for six months. The type of club as you entered this club, you went down two steps, physically and socially. <laughs> it was a tough business, you know. There were certain guys I'm not afraid of. I know I can beat them up, you know. Like a guy who's wearing a sweater that he knitted himself. <laughs> I mean, I worked in tough places, you know. I started in this business over in Brooklyn. I worked over in Red Hook, Canarsie. Even the names are tough, you know. Red Hook, Canarsie. I mean, you take a town like uh, Pleasantville, you know it's harmless, you know. I mean, I'm far from a fighter, but I feel like I could beat up anyone who comes from Pleasantville. <laughs> just got another feeling. After the show, there'll be a guy waiting for me. Hey, Pleasantville! <laughs> you know the trouble with me? I appeal to everyone who can do me absolutely no good. <laughs> My friends told me to get ahead, you gotta meet big people, prominent people. I don't hit it off to the prominent people. Prominent people look at me, they only have one thought. There but for the grace of God. <laughs> they say behind every successful man is a woman. You take a good look at me. Can you picture what I got behind me? <laughs> Nothing comes easy with me. Think of the hotels I stayed at, too. I stayed at one place, left a wake-up call. They missed by a day and a half. <laughs> that showbiz. You've got to be careful sometimes. You drink too much in this business, you know. Can't help you. Come in here sober. You want to stay sober. And we'll suddenly say, Rodney, is a friend of yours here. Have a drink. Rodney, a friend to drink before you know. An hour later, it's stupid time. You know? When I drink the next day, I gotta do two things. I gotta try and locate my car, and I gotta bring back the car I took. <laughs> oh, when I'm drunk, I do funny things, you know. One time I got blasted a few months ago. I was home the next day suffering, hating myself, hating myself. Oh, miserable with the head, the whole thing, you know, terrible. My wife was hanging around throwing her lines at me. You dance, now pay the fiddler. <laughs> My kid came over and said, Daddy, let's play horsey. And I said, kid, your horse is scratched. Bring it on, bring it. No, you gotta be careful. I remember one time I got loaded. I ended up in a Chinese restaurant in 49th Street. They know me there, it's open all night. Since I walk in, they looked at me, wait a stupid time, stupid time. And I, uh, I woke and I sat down that night, I developed a new style of eating. <laughs> Napping between courses. <laughs> now it's a peculiar feeling to wake up holding a spare rib. <laughs> One time I woke up, there was three Chinese faces looking at me. I figured this is it, they took over. What do I know? <laughs> no, I tell you, with me nothing comes easy, nothing. I'm so disappointed this business over with girls. So there'll be more girls and children, you know. Can't get lucky. Every time I meet a girl, she just turned over a new leaf. It's <laughs> another thing, I get no respect with girls either. You know? There was one girl I met, she told me I reminded her of someone who used to bother her. <laughs> uh, she wasn't nice at all. Went out on a first date with this girl, you know. While I was out with her, she ran into some guy she knew, introduced me to him. She said, Steve, this is Rodney. Rodney, this is goodbye. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what, girls, I don't think like other guys. All I got to go with girls who are fads. Girls been around, girls who swing, not me. I want to go out with a good girl, a girl who's never played around. I figure she's due. <laughs> hey, you can't believe girls either. Girls say things like, it's all right if a man is older than a woman. Age makes no difference. Looks, looks is not important. Money, money means nothing. That's what they say, you know. But I never met a girl yet who fell in love with an old, ugly man who's broke. Never, never. <laughs> no, girls, I don't think right, you know. There was one girl I had a date when she told me to bring up a pint. I got ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even look for pretty girls anymore. To me, I mean, I'll settle if a girl has a nice voice. I went out with a girl, she had a beautiful voice. Gee, the whole night I just sat there 
She kept talking and talking and oh, I just sat there, you know. Beautiful voice. And I couldn't take my ears off her. <laughs> but that's what people about looks too much. Everything is lose weight, look thin. They go to doctors, they get pills, injections. These things mean nothing. I found only one way to look thin. You hang out with fat people and tell me it's the only way, you know? It's the same way you talk to people who are afraid of getting gray hair. Actually, it's wonderful to have gray hair. I mean, ask any man who's bald, anyone out here. I don't know. <laughs> but what's looks? Looks is nothing. It's underneath what counts. Soul, depth. That's what's important, not looks. I mean, how many times you take a walk in the street, you see a tall, handsome man walking arm in arm with a short, fat, ugly girl. I never saw that. Did you ever see that? I never saw that. Huh? I thought I saw that. I don't think I ever will see that either. No, but looks don't mean nothing. I got a niece, an ugly girl. She got married. She's happy now. She married an ugly guy. And today they got two very ugly kids. In fact, they're all so ugly. In a family album, they only keep the negatives. <laughs> oh, I talk about girls. Actually, I'm married. You, know. you, you can tell I'm married, right? I have that warm look about me. Now, I'm married, and to me, you know, my wife is smarter than all these other girls I went out with. Because since I'm married, my wife taught me things I never knew when I was single. Well, she taught me that the wife's clothes go on the wooden hangers. <laughs> husband's clothes, the wire hangers. I also found out that the husband's closet never comes with the apartment. <laughs> Get four screws and easy instructions. A child can put it together. You know. I went around the whole neighborhood looking for a child. I couldn't put it together. What do I know from that? You know? I also find out since I'm married, my wife loves contrast. She must love contrast. She marries me, keeps talking about Marcello Mastriani. Yeah, I took her to an Italian movie a year ago. That's all I hear is Marcello Mastriani. Uh, to me, it sounds like a side dish. <laughs> But I'll tell you, these Italian guys, they make love, they're wild. This country here is like Sweet Sixteen. Oh, there they look mean, they growl, they look at the girl, you know. They grab, it's a violent love scene. I want to kiss my wife, I'm like an idiot, I can't get started. I come home when I last week, I want to get something started. I said to myself, tonight, tonight, no more nice guy. Tonight, I'm going to act like this side dish. I took her in my arms, I looked in her eyes, I went to She went home to her mother, I never had a chance, the whole thing collapsed. Like and I got weird in-laws, weird people. I was over there apartment the other night, my in-laws. All over the walls, I got nude paintings of them. I'll tell you what, you know, since I'm married, I never have to worry about bad breath. I don't get a chance to open my mouth. I mean, sometimes I turn to my wife for some understanding, but it don't help. She's a cold person, you know. She was always cold. Remember the first time I kissed her? I felt guilty, you know, because I wanted to open my eyes. And I know when you kiss, you're not supposed to open your eyes. I said to myself, go ahead, I don't feel guilty. Open your eyes. And so I opened my eyes. And she was staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble with her is she keeps telling me what to do. The first thing she told me, I should never throw out a shirt. She keeps looking at the cuffs. And as soon as they get frayed, it becomes a short sleeve shirt. And when the collar goes, I end up with a pajama top. Right now, I got 23 short sleeve pajama tops, you know? Well, sometimes I got nothing to do. I sit around the house all day changing pajama tops. It's wild. But with her clothes, it's different. When she buys clothes, she tells me it's for my benefit. Because people judge me by the way she looks. And she doesn't want our friends to think that I'm doing bad, you know? So I borrow money from our friends to buy her clothes so our friends can think. <laughs> Every time I leave my house, my wife tells me to call her in case something goes right. <laughs> I figure like that. There's another way that my wife don't show me respect, you know. Sometimes she forgets something from the store. She sends me to the supermarket to do some shopping. It's one place I hate to go, the supermarket. I mean, I try to picture myself as a mature man. And I find it very hard to act mature when I have to stand with a group of women and feel tomatoes. <laughs> the only reason I feel them is because everyone else is feeling me. I don't even know what I'm feeling for. And I don't think the women know either. 
I went shopping the other day, there was one tomato there, four women felt it and left it there. A fifth woman came along, felt the same tomato and took it. Finally, it was my turn, I picked out three tomatoes. I mean, I felt them first, you know. I didn't want the women to think I was stupid. As soon as I got the tomatoes home, my wife started to feel it. And she gave me one of her, you're an idiot looks, you know. You call these tomatoes? I don't call these tomatoes. I said, what do you call them, bananas? She said, you took these tomatoes? How come no one else took these tomatoes? I said, how could someone else take these tomatoes when I took these tomatoes? She said, you're taking them back. You'll ask for Lou. He'll give you tomatoes. And then she told me that Lou only knows her by sight. He doesn't know her name. That I have her picture in my wallet. I should show Lou her picture. He'll take care of me. I went back to the store. I found Lou. Lou had a pencil in his ear, a cigar in his mouth, and he was wearing a sweatshirt marked Coney Island Parachute Shop. <laughs> I went over to him, I said, Lou, it's a picture of my wife. You know this woman? He said, look, buddy, I'm a married man. I don't play around, you know? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, times haven't changed, you know. The wife was never happy with what he brought home. You can go back as far as the caveman days. The man would go out looking for food all day, and the woman would sit and wait for him. As soon as he came back to the cave, she would let him have it. Uh, here he is, the hunter. What do we got tonight? Wolf. Wolf. Let me ask you something. What forest did you go to? That's a little forest. By 12 o'clock, the best animals are gone. I told you, go across the river, you'll come to Super Forest. And tonight, they're open late. You can kill till 9 o'clock. I mean, how many dishes can I make with wolf? I made wolf for young, sweet and sour wolf, butterfly wolf. I told you, you don't have to kill the first animal that comes along. You look around, you see what other people are killing. I'll tell you the truth, you've changed. You're not the same man I married. Since you're able to stand up straight, no one can talk to you anymore. I tell you, though, it's nice here. You know, chance to get out of my neighborhood, you know. I live here in New York on the west side. A rough neighborhood, rough. In fact, on my block, they just put up a new sign. It says, drive fast. The life you save may be your own. In well, my neighborhood, the best-selling book is How to Attack in a Self-Service Elevator. It's the thing that bothers me in my building, you know. Like we got no doorman, and I come home at night and I ring the bell. Then my wife presses something upstairs and the front door buzzes. When I hear that buzz, I walk in. Every night when I come home, there's always some strange guy standing there who walks in with me on my buzz. It happened the other night, some guy that walked in with me on my buzz. I listened for his buzz. He had no buzz. <laughs> We got in the elevator, I pressed my button, I live in the top floor of 15, and he pressed his button. Roof. <laughs> when I got off, I said to him, good night. He said, I'll see you later. <laughs> I'll tell you, any building here in New York, I find the easiest way to get into any building. I just press a button, they call down a the house for me, say, who is it? I say, it's me. They open right up as you walk around there, you know what I mean? Sometimes they say, who? I say, it's me, it's me. Oh, I'm sorry, they open right up your walk right in. It's very simple, you know. Well, no, I'll tell you, in my neighborhood, they're always knocking on your door. They're always knocking on your door, asking you to support different movements, drives, causes, you know. A guy knocked my door last week. He told me how the Korean people need our help. And he said, if I give just one dollar, then Sue Gu and his wife and 12 kids, they can have rice for a whole year. Not only can I have rice for a whole year, but the kids all get books and pencils. And Sue Gu can get a new boat. And they can send four kids through college. Now I'll tell you, I'd be very happy to give Sue Gu a dollar. If he would show my wife how to stretch a buck that far. <laughs> I live in an older building now. A much older building. I live in a kind of building like 
when I take a shower, I never get under it right away, you know. The first five minutes, I get rust. <laughs> and while I'm taking a shower, if someone in the building takes a cold drink of water, I get burnt. <laughs> like a radiator's the whistle. I figured out why they whistle, you know. I mean, the heat comes up so seldom, they celebrate. It's a whole thing with them there, you know. And I got shades. If you want them to go up, you gotta pull them down. And if you want them to stay in one position, you have to hold them for a while. So you let go softly. And you walk away gently. You know. The other day I had all the shades just where I wanted them. The bell rang. They all went up. It was the end of it. No, when things go wrong in the apartment, I tell you, I got no help from the superintendent. I'm always looking for the super. I'll tell you, to me, the most elusive person there is is an apartment house superintendent. Every time I look for him, it's the same thing. He was just here, he was over there, he's here, he's there, he's everywhere. He's the Scarlet Pimpernel, that's who he is. <laughs> Always looking for the super. Now my super's an easy man to recognize, too. He's a short man, he has an accent, and when you talk to him, he walks away from you. <laughs> I live in this building six years, the only time I see the super is Christmas. He sets up a tree in the lobby and keeps taking envelopes from all the tenants. <laughs> I'll tell you, last Christmas, he opened my envelope, he was so surprised, you know? I gave him a list of all the things he didn't do. And <laughs> there's one place I hate to look for the soup, but that's in the basement. Because I found out, with, I got nothing to say with people I meet in the basement. Who do you meet in the basement? You always meet a guy who's lost. <laughs> Whenever I'm in the basement, I always hear some guy saying, hey, how do I get out of here, you know? I'll tell you where I live, there's all different races, nationalities. Every day in my kid's schoolyard, I see handwriting on a handball court there. You know? I see things like, uh, Seymour loves Estralita. <laughs> Roses are red, violets are blue, Mary Wong has the flu, everything I see up there. And my kid, he goes to the toughest school in New York. I had to go over there last week, a kid was acting up, I had to go see the guidance counselor. They told me he was out, he'll be back in one to three years. <laughs> it's a rough school. I looked in one class, they were teaching the kids arithmetic. I heard the teacher say, Johnny has 50 cents. If he steals another quarter, how much does he have? <laughs> well, my kids' school, forget about history. The kids there, they think Washington crossed the Delaware because he had a girl in Jersey. <laughs> The teacher said to one kid, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. The kid said, what do you got for the cops? <laughs> well, when I was a kid, the most important thing was to be able to take it. And I remember guys on my block, guys who could take it. Guys like moose, <laughs> ox, bull, the bear. I mean, these guys were animals. <laughs> but when they had a fight, they could take it. And they never complained. They were always all right. No, I'm all right. I'm all right. Okay. Oh, that guy, get out of there. You mean when he drove the car into me? No, I'm all right. No. It was a white car. It don't mean nothing. No, I'm all right. No, no my, te my teeth are all right. They had to come out anyway. No, I'm all right. I mean, I wasn't looking for no fight, you know. It started when he banged my wrist with the pipe. When I tried to stop, I grabbed his pipe and my wrench. When he took the pliers, he pulled my ear. He got me mad. Oh, I told him tomorrow we're gonna fight again, you know. Only tomorrow. No rules. <laughs> forget my neighborhood, forget it. Dude. No, I'll tell you, you know, I got all kinds of problems. I really have. You know. In fact, I just broke up with my psychiatrist. Yeah, this afternoon, for the first time, I told him I got suicidal tendencies. You know. And told me from now on I have to pay in advance. <laughs> I got rid of my family doctor too, you know. He's a weird doctor. He told me I should keep smoking if I want to stop chewing gum. <laughs> There's a lot of doctors around who shouldn't be doctors. It's their parents' fault, you know. Yeah, they want their kids to be doctors. They train their kids because they don't want to be a doctor. I got to my neighborhood a couple. They trained their son to be a doctor. Doctor for 10 years and he quit it. Didn't want it. Wanted to fix television sets. <laughs> In the neighborhood now, fixing sets. You know. I said, when bad last week, I called him over the house. And I'll tell you, being a doctor for 10 years had an effect on what this guy fixes the television set. Walked in the house, the first thing he did, put all his tools in boiling water. <laughs> and he looked at my wife and myself, he said, are you the immediate family? <laughs> I said, why, is it serious? He said, what your set has is very common. There's a lot of it going around today. 
You got a weak tool. I could replace it, but I'd rather try and save it. <laughs> so I'll take this up to my shop. Let us just take it easy, hang around, watch television. At this point he had me crazy too. I said, the condition set is in. Is it all right to be moved? Finally took it out, I took it to a place called TV Hospital. <laughs> the next day I got a bill for $132. I found out he gave my set a private room. <laughs> That's another thing, you know. People take advantage of me. They think I'm dumb. I mean, bums tell me they'll pay me back. <laughs> I tell you, my whole life, all I mean is characters, you know? So much hate in the world. The trouble with me is I hate myself, I'm self-destructive. I mean, I hate myself so much when girls tell me yes, I tell them to think it over. <laughs> it's a rough business show business. You don't know what till you're in it, what you go through, to try to punch, to get ahead, you know? A lot of comedians, though, they get ahead because they, they work with a big singer, and they get in good with him. Yeah, and then the big singer takes him on all the jobs, you know. I would put a big singer and try to get a good one. It didn't work out. One night in his room, they had a party, you know. And I, I went over to him and I said, some people are bothering me. You know, I said, maybe I'm going to give you a hand and help to keep people out of your room, you know. He told me to keep out of his room. <laughs> I always have trouble at parties, you know. My biggest problem is getting by the doorman. I always hear, hold it, just a minute there. And they reach for the house phone. Mr. Walters, there's a guy down here, I thought I'd call first, you know. Uh-huh, yeah, I'll ask him. Say, buddy, you play the accordion? <laughs> no. As soon as I get into a party, if I do get it, I'm always answering questions, you know. You say you're a friend of who? <laughs> How long do you know Tom? <clears throat> <laughs> oh, if I'm not available for a party, no one is ever upset. They'll always forgive me. I remember one party, and they called it off because I was in town. <laughs> Well, at parties, I watch myself. I mean, the first half hour, I don't take any food, you know, I watch every kid, I don't take up a chair, nothing. You know. And as soon as I take one bite of something, they let me have it, you know. You're still eating, huh? You can pack it away, can't you, huh? Gives you an idea how fantastic my social life is. Do me a favor, will you? I walked off tonight. Don't tell me I did it wrong. Got a lot of pressure going for me. It's a pressure. It's like a heaviness that's on top of me. Always there, this heaviness. Ever since I'm a kid, I walk in the street, it's always on top of me. And you people don't know how bad this heaviness is. To give you an idea how sick I am, right now, at this very moment, I hear laughs. I mean, it's bad, this heaviness. Other people wake up in the morning, ah, new day, up and out of my wake up, the heaviness that's right there waiting for me, nice, you know. And sometimes I didn't talk to it. And I say, hi, heaviness. <laughs> and the heaviness looks back at me, you know, today you're gonna get it good, don't worry about it. You'll be drinking early today. And people, I don't wanna drink, you know. Tonight, I don't wanna drink. So what am I asking you for? For what? Like everyone else, I like applause. They mean nothing to you, but a lot to me. But when I walk off, if, if you just, oh, not you, you're all just sitting there looking at me, aren't you? Sitting and looking all here, saying to yourselves, him, we know him, he's in show business for one reason, girls. Wants to get girls in hotel rooms with booze and swing, that's what he wants. How wrong you could be. Because if you knew me, you'd know that underneath there was a tenderness and a sensitivity. And I'm in this business for only one reason. To earn enough money to buy a farm. <laughs> and that's all I want is a good piece of bottomland. 
I want to sweat with the oxen. And at night, I want to hear, come and get it, come and get it. Oh, the farm. I want to fetch things. I want to pay my doctor with a hog. I want to hang out at the general store and spit at the stove. I want to live by the good book. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. How do, Miss Amy? He has the farm. And I'll work the farm with my bare hands and build it up. And someday I'll sell the farm at a big profit. And then I'll get the broads in the room with the booze and I'll swing when I get that farm. I tell you. Rodney Dangerfield, ladies and gentlemen. The Rodney Dangerfield.